All right, we'll give it another second or two. Let some stragglers get in and then we'll kick things off. Also, uh, before we do begin, I'm, uh, we want to take a little more of a classroom approach since we do have a Rice professor presenting to us today. Um, so I, I raise your hand if you are willing and able to, to speak now. There should be a hand raising tool. Um, and I'm just going to keep tabs of that. So throughout the presentation or when we do Q&A at the end, um, we can call on you. And I just don't want to call on you if you, if you aren't in a position where you can, but we'd like to make this interactive. Um, but let's kick things off. So welcome everyone to the Exit Advisor Small Business Town Hall. And thank you for joining us. Uh, today we've got a very important series, which is the, the ultimate exit, selling your business to a strategic. Um, and this is one of the kind of the culmination of our entire, you know, M&A preparation and process. This is really the, the ultimate exit, as we call it. Um, and and it's, it's really the culmination of all of our efforts. Our process, um, which you which you may or may not know, it's, it's a little bit different than most other, you know, larger investment banks or consulting groups. And, and we really distinguish ourselves. In, in three different ways. First, we're a, a boutique, and not just in the sense that we're small, but we take a really hyper-focused and tailored approach working with our clients, and, and we may be working with them years in advance before they, you know, get to this ultimate exit. Um, we like to go in and, and not just look at the financials and, and then put them out on the market as a business broker would, but we're really going in and identifying the red flags and finding ways to increase the value, um, especially if it's gonna go to a strategic or a private equity backed company that is you know, within the strategic space. Um, we really like to get all your ducks in a row so that you're gonna reap the most value and get the most transparent and seamless transaction. Um, the second is we take Obviously, with, with Al and, and also even Gary, uh, we take an education-based approach, um, which we're going to do today. So again, you know, raise your hands if you're willing to be called on, because um, we're going to get interactive. Um, and, you know, treat this like a, like a little bit of an MBA class. Um, but yeah, education, it's very important. Like I said, we, we, we don't just churn and burn deals. We really like to work with our clients um, intimately and help educate them on this process. Uh, the third way is, you know, this is the most unique, but we are, we're founded by entrepreneurs, most notably, you know, Gary and, and Al, um, who have owned and operated and built from the ground up businesses and have gone through this exact process firsthand. Um, and, and really, there's no one better to teach this than Al. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce Al now. Um, obviously, he's our, the managing partner, but he's also a graduate professor at Rice. Um, and it's, I've had the, the, the real distinct pleasure of not only getting to work with Al now, but having also learned from him while I was at Rice um, in the MBA program there. And take it from me, he is extremely well regarded in this area um, it, to the tune of having received the, the or been honored with the teaching of teaching excellence award to the, the past two years actually. Um, so he, he really understands this and it's not just from an academic perspective. He, like I said, he's owned and operated and built companies from the ground up and he's been on both sides of the table so he hasn't, it's not just teaching, but it's also coaching businesses and he's lived and breathed this um, from a practical standpoint. So I really do mean it when there's no one better to present this type of topic than Al. Um, so Al, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to you and let you kick things off. Thank you, Andrew, I really appreciate it. And uh, if you spoke like that in my classroom, you might've got better grades. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Andrew, Andrew is a great, great student. And like, like he says, you know, I, I love to teach. I love to, uh, to educate. And so what I want to do today is kind of try, try to incorporate a uh, classroom component of it. Some, sometimes when you're giving these presentations, it's just like you're talking here, you know, in, in the abyss. So 
love to get some feedback. I'm going to uh, try to encourage some class participation. Uh, some incentives, what, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, uh, raise your hand uh, with the little, the little hand raising uh, icon. Andrew will call on you. And uh, we've got $15 gift certificates to uh, Common Bond, our good friend George Joseph. Um, if you take a shot and, and do a decent job answering the question, not gonna have to be perfect, but but uh, we'll we'll grade about seventy percent of participation. So uh, let, let's have a little fun too. So with that said, here here's the lessons for today. Uh, I want to um, we we'll really understand the difference between financial value and strategic value. Uh, I, I've already given a couple of town halls on financial valuation. Strategic valuation is a little different. Like Andrew said, it's kind of the ultimate exit. So we'll talk through that. We'll talk a little bit about why a strategic buyer will typically pay more uh, than a pure financial buyer. We'll talk about how do you capture strategic value? How do you target and find strategic acquirers? I'm gonna walk through a couple uh, examples, a couple real life examples, and then we'll end it with, uh, with, with Q&A. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off right here. Who wants to take a shot at uh, what's financial value? I see a couple ex students out there too. So um, I know you learned this, but who can tell me what uh, what financial value is? Yeah, go ahead and, and use the, the hand raise and, and we'll call on you. And this is for a $15 common bond gift certificate. Sarah Whiteford. Hey guys. Um, so financial value is going to be the value of the company as a measure of its profitability. So generally earnings before income, tax, depreciation, et cetera, um, multiplied by the multiplier that the company would put to it. All right, let's see the answer. Sarah, get it right. How about, uh, how about the hand clapping? Clap, clap your hands if, if Sarah got it right, close enough. I'll let Andrew be the final judge. So financial value, like Sarah said, it's, it's the value of a business by uh, kind of expected return for the risk of the business, a multiple that Sarah talked about uh, of the cash flow stream and potential future cash flow stream, which the business could generate on its own. So, uh, is that close enough, Andrew? You oh, know? I, I think I so. Know. I think you know. Good job, Sarah. All right, Sarah, first one, $15 common bond gift certificate. So, uh, so, so Sarah got it. It's really just the financial value. So if you're looking at like any other investment, if you're gonna invest in a stock, if you're gonna invest in real estate, if you invest in a bond, um, it's expected return for the risk. So let's see here, here's the averages. This is a, the Pepperdine stock. Pepperdine puts this out every year. We can send you a copy of it. It's, it's nationwide averages of small business valuations. Um, Small business valuations, we'll, we'll look at SDE, that's seller's discretionary earnings. It's all the earnings that are available to the seller um, to, after he or she has paid all the bills, all the operating expenses for the company, reinvest in money, required money back in the company. It's a free cash flow that's available. So for businesses that are under $500,000 in SDE, we see this multiple. It's, it's pretty low. It's only, it's only a couple times uh, the cash flow that the owner is going to take out. Now, out of that, they have to pay their salary, their expenses, uh, 401ks and stuff as, as well. But um, it's only a couple times that number. Uh, 500 to a million, it goes, it goes up a little bit, and a million to two million goes up to about three times. As we go up in size, we kind of move away from the seller's discretionary earnings, and we factor in there a salary for the owner of the business or for the manager of the business who runs it, and we start talking about EBITDA. Again, pretty much free cash flow. Two to $5 million, uh, we get up to about uh, four times, 4.5 a few years ago. Market was a little hotter, it was about five times. Um, as so we get to five to $50 million in earnings, it goes up from there. And again, these are pretty much financial valuations. It's just, uh, what's the business based on from a financial valuation? Uh, anyone wanna take a shot at, uh, Let's go, we'll go through this, I'll ask one more. So, so we see these averages, and then off to the far right of this bell curve, we see strategic value. And these can be some pretty crazy valuations that we'll talk about. Um, 
Who wants to take a shot at strategic value? What's the definition of strategic valuation? I'm gonna take a shot. Another $15 common bond gift certificate. Raise your hand. Con, current student, Con. Go ahead, Con. Hope you get this one. Andrew, can you unmute Con? I think his mic's unmuted. Hey, Con, go ahead. You ought to be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, for for strategic value, we go above and beyond uh, the typical uh, market multiple because there is strategic value that that additional business generates uh, for the for the acquirer. Uh, and that can be in the way of uh, very synergies, uh, be it, um, you know, connections to the existing line of business, uh, various, um, you know, complementary business offerings, uh, procurement synergies, um, you know, all, all various things that, that add additional value to the strategic acquirer that they're willing to pay above and beyond, um, you know, what, a, what the financial value uh, of a small business typically is. All right, good definition. Let's see if, let's see if Khan got it. So uh, strategic value is my definition. Strategic value is created when a buyer extracts greater value from the acquisition than can be provided by the profits generated by the business. The buyer can generate greater profits uh, than those which the acquired business is able to achieve or could achieve in the future if it was a standalone business. Andrew, what do you think? Con nail it? For sure. All right, I, th I, th I think he got it. So, so yeah, it's, so uh, it's, it's the additional value that a business can get, um, or even, even maybe an individual can get by acquiring the business above and beyond the, the cash flow. So we're gonna walk through some examples of what that is, but it's just additional benefit that this acquirer can get. So at the end of the day, if you're out hunting and you're targeting for acquirers of the business, that's what you want to get. You know, who can benefit more than just the cash flows that the business is, is, is throwing off? So um, who, can, who can give an example of just outside of business what a strategic uh, purchase might be? This is kind of a bonus question. Might be a, might be a little bit tougher, but I use this example. Who, who, who can maybe throw out there what what could be a strategic act? Brian Holthouse. Brian, hey, welcome uh, back, another former student. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. You're fine. Yeah. So I'm going to go with uh, hot dog buns. Hot dog okay. buns on their own, they provide some calories, pretty bland, not worth a whole lot. Uh, but if I've already got hot dogs, you know, my strategic value of adding the buns to my meal is worth more than just the caloric or taste value of some plain bread. So you might be willing to pay more for those hot dog buns if you had hot dogs and to combine them together, right? Yep. That's a great, Brian, that's A plus. A, a plus effort. And you were always an A plus student, I remember. Uh, <laughs> great, great example. Great, great example, Brian. Um, you know, Something that you're willing to pay a little bit more for, you know, because it complements what something you already have. Uh, you know, talk about a house in a neighborhood. There might be fair market value for a house in a neighborhood, but maybe if you're having a, a baby, your parents are in there, and grandma and grandpa can be close by. You're going to pay more for that house, right? You're going to pay more for it, a little bit more. So, um, let's talk about uh, why pay more than fair market value in a business. Why would you pay more than fair market value? So you get a business valuation done, the business is worth $5 million. Why might you pay more for that business? What are just some of the reasons? I've got about 10 of them here. Go ahead. <clears throat> Josh Ritchie. All right, Josh. Josh is a local like financial planner. Here, I, I've been <laughs> Thanks for having me. I, I'd venture to guess that there's probably tax advantages in terms of depreciation if you overpay in some situations. Well, there could be some tax advantages. Yeah, that's actually not on my list, Josh, but I'll give you credit for that one. That's, uh, it, it could be. There, there could be some potential tax advantages 
in an acquiring company, uh, acquiring maybe a smaller company, right? Um, what else? What else we have out there? James, you want to unmute? There you go. Who's on? J James? I'm on. Okay. You hear me? Yep. Yeah. The most difficult thing in sales, period, is earning the first customer, earning that first opportunity in. If I acquire a company and they already have a strategic, strong relationship with a big company, call it Coca Cola, call it Exxon call it SAP, that is worth a mint of money. Because when you acquire them, you instantly become their vendor. Yeah, exactly, James, that's a great one. I mean, you're, you're buying a relationship that otherwise not, may not be able to get. And let's say you're a big company trying to get into Pepsi or Coca-Cola, Frito-Lay. Uh, you know, when I sold my printing company, we were the, an approved printing vendor for Anheuser-Busch, had about 500 Anheuser-Busch wholesalers as our clients. So the acquiring company got all those relationships. Certainly worth a premium, right? Certainly worth a premium. Good one. What else we got? Marco. Yeah. So, so mine's... Uh, my thought is this, you can generate a higher rate of return uh, to justify the premium that you're paying. How, how, might, how might that be? Uh, it could be through synergies. It could be a lot of things that, that would create that. Well, it's Mark Days. Yeah. Yeah, so synergies, right? Really, really good synergies. Uh, Mark, what, are, what might a few of those synergies be? Uh, it could be um, cost of raw materials. Um, it could be as simple as um, you know reducing overhead. You have duplication in uh, sales, the back office. Uh, those are some of the examples. Yeah, synergies, reduced cost, combined expenses, uh, all that stuff. What about you, Marco? Marco. My comment was right along those lines where in evaluating the business, you see some low hanging fruit to come in and decrease cost or increase revenues one way or another. Uh, and so capturing that growth or accounting for that growth that might allow you to put that plan in place to pay a little bit more uh, yep. that might be overlooked. Good. How about some others? Sarah, you want to go again? And then I think we had Jason as well. Yeah. I can go. I think it's, I think it's been spoken to, but if you can better leverage their assets, then they could, then it's worth the premium, um, if not more. Yeah. Yeah, so better leverage, make better use of the, the assets within the company. Better leverage them. Uh, right? Take an in increased uh, utilization, production, capacity, right? Come on, Jason. All right, let's, 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 take, uh, let's take one more. Uh, sorry, the one that I had was access to te technologies, um, either by causing your competition to not be able to access that technology or to uh, have something that can streamline and build out the, the core business. Yeah, that's a really big one, Sarah. Uh, new technology, you get ac access to technology, right? And if it's patented, you get that technology, maybe a competitor can't get it, right? So it can be a huge premium put on that, on, on techno uh, technology or a patent. Um, anyone else? Is there one more out there? And then I'll, then I'll move on. Yeah, Sometimes I got one. Maybe kind of a flip side to what uh, was said earlier about acquiring new customers. Maybe you can, take some competitors offline uh, and kind of clear some space for yourself in your market. Great one. That's on my list. That's a great one. Eliminate a competitor, right? Especially in a small market, right? Elim eliminate a competitor to pay a premium for that. So uh, great. I think let, let, let's go. Through, uh, I'll go through them. I'm, I think we hit, we hit most of them. 
Um, sometimes a, a strategic acquirer will pay more because they don't have to factor as much risk in. They understand the business and the industry much better. They can get through due diligence. They understand it better. So just that simple fact um, of being with in the industry and in the business as opposed to an outsider coming in. So when we talk about how financial value is determined, it's risk, right? It's the expected return that you're gonna get for the investment that you make. So the riskier it is, the lower the value to compensate for that risk. But if you understand the business and the industry better, you're gonna uh, have more confidence going into it and can give a higher valuation than just someone from the outside. I'm not sure we had, uh, you know, a really big one in, in, in today's uh, market, uh, certainly pre-COVID, was just an aqua hire. So it's an acquisition to hire and add employees. So we had a huge shortage of uh, skilled labor in the Gulf Coast with everything going on. So a lot of acquisitions just to add additional labor, right? A geographic expansion. Somebody may be just wanting to come into that market and are going to pay a premium for it. So we sold our printing company, my operation, to a national company, and they didn't have a footprint uh, in Texas in the Southwest. We became kind of their footprint, so that was important. Uh, eliminate a competitor was mentioned. Expanding distribution channels, right? I've got my products. I can buy and get distribution into California, New York, uh, other areas. Uh, I can sell products and services to new customers. So we'll talk about an example of a local company later that um, when they did the acquisition, they were able to sell their products to the acquirer's companies, uh, customers. So you've got that. I think we mentioned, I think Mark Davis mentioned increased factory facility utilization. You can just increase your capacity. So when we bought printing companies, theoretically our printing company could run 24 seven. Uh, we always try to target having a second shift we could just acquire a company, close them down, and move them in with us, and then we could factor that in and, and run uh, additional time, get, get higher utilization. Uh, cost efficiencies increase buying power. Someone said suppliers re reduce relative overhead for the number of employees that the two companies have, consolidated office space uh, facilities. Um, certainly increase revenue and profits and company value to the acquiring company. So as we saw earlier, as companies go up in size, they increase in relative value. They get higher multiples, higher valuations, uh, new technologies, and just, just sometimes just public, uh, public relations, uh, the image. You know, uh, we'll talk about a, uh, an acquisition later that we worked with here in Houston. Uh, it was a big international company, acquired them, and just the pub PR that they got from it, from just making that acquisition and the press releases. Uh, was an incredible increase in value. So there's a lot of reasons why a company will pay more than fair market value. Uh, it, mean, it means more, it just means more to them, right? Um, so how do, how do we do this when we're doing it from a, uh, an analytical or a, a process standpoint? So what we do is we look at, uh, we, we start, we've created this uh, kind of valuation pyramid and we start with EBITDA, I start with what's the base earnings that the company's gonna generate. And again, if it's just a financial buyer, that's all they're gonna really look at. How much cash flow am I getting? What's my return gonna be? But then we uh, go up a rung and we start to look for strategic benefits. What are the strategic benefits uh, in the acquiring company? Do they want new products, vertical, horizontal integration, uh, geographical expansion, adding brands, uh, I had speakers in my class last uh, two weeks ago from Yellow Rose Whiskey. They started it as a class project, uh, built it up, and they sold to a big international company, Spanish company, and they wanted to have a Texas whiskey brand. So it meant a lot, big premium to them just to have that brand. So what are the strategic benefits? Um, what synergies are there? Cost savings opportunities, consolidation, reduction uh, in, in workforce, uh, technologies, all these synergies, that adds another layer of value. And then just plain assets, having an established workforce, real estate, patents, equipment. Uh, Jason said asset utilization and, and increasing that. So these assets um, can add additional value on top of just the financial value. Uh, Cross-selling is a huge one. Two companies merge, now all of a sudden the acquiring company has access to the uh, target company, the company that they acquired products and services and distribution. 
and vice versa, right? So all these opportunities um, are out there. And then there can just be some, a list of uh, miscellaneous ones, uh, health healthcare efficiencies, some overhead uh, <clears throat> reductions, just miscellaneous stuff. So when, when we take a look at, you know, who the ideal acquirer would be, we're trying to capture this and really in turn uh, start to look to, to, to quantify it. How do, how do we quantify that? Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Any, are there any questions on that? Anything else that uh, maybe was missed in there? Uh, I'll throw in there. Um, let, me, let me stop sharing for a second. I'm gonna show you how one of the ways that we quantify this uh, on a simple model. Can you all see this okay? Yeah, you might wanna zoom in a little bit. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I spent kind of my earlier days, first half of my career acquiring uh, commercial printing companies and we would just close up, mostly close the doors up, consolidate them in to uh, our location. And what a target, what an acquiring company is doing internally, they, if they're a big company, they've got a bunch of financial <coughs> analysts, maybe some consultants, and they're going through and they're quantifying all these savings and synergies, right? Some are just strategic benefit, but at the end of the day, how's it going to impact the cash flow? So long before the days of Excel like this, literally we took a back of the napkin and said, okay, if we close down this commercial printing company, well, we're going to get all their lease expense. We're going to get the receptionist. We're going to get uh, some office staff. Uh, we're going to sell off some of the equipment and we would run an analysis and all of a sudden something that maybe was making $100,000 to us might be making $250,000 or more. So this is what the other side is doing. If it's a private equity group, if it's a strategic buyer, uh, even if it's just a financial person coming in, they're going to do it and they're going to model out what will it look like under my ownership. I'm going to take uh, some equity, I might take an SBA loan, this is what we use in my class, and they're going to run and model their returns. What does the selling side have to do? They have to guess what they're doing and look at the other side and say, what does it look like to them if they acquire my company? What are they going to eliminate? Uh, what are they going to add? How's it going to impact our cash flow? And when we represent a, a company or a seller, we are trying to run these same models and coming back and saying, okay, yeah, look, we, we show $500,000 in EBITDA, but to you, it's going to mean more. Uh, and we try to quantify it. So it's really not an argument. It's more or less just a discussion. That's what we come up with. So this is a, this is a model. I would be more than happy to send it out to everybody. Um, uh, you can play with it. This is a summary, but underneath all the operating expenses, you're gonna be running, okay, what's it gonna look like as we make these reductions, make these changes, right? What's that gonna do to my gross profit margin? What's that gonna do to my, my, my net income? Uh, am I gonna have additional manager's compensation, less manager's compensation, right? And I'm going to get down to what my cash flow is going to be, and I can model out for a few years, and then model my returns. Uh, yeah, any uh, you know MBA students that are out, out there going to go into financial, uh, become financial analysts, go into investment banking. This is this is a lot of what you're going to do. This is a lot of, the, of what the whole the whole process is. So we'll uh, we'll we'll send that out to everybody. Um, and at the end of the day, the acquiring company wants to know, you know, what, I'm, what am I going to get in return? Um, model it. So let's go back to PowerPoint. Um, so again, this is, a, this is what we, we try to do when we're, when we're looking out there and we're advising the client and where are these potential synergies going to be. And, and a lot of times it's in discussions. You know, what do you, what do you plan to do? Uh, how are we going to cross sell? Um, you know, what jobs are you going to eliminate? Yeah. Where are you going to put the new company? So you, you're working through that. Um, you know, how do you target these strategic acquirers? How do, you, how do you target them? Well, you start right out. Who's got the most to gain? Now, who, who has the most to gain from acquiring my company? 
uh, in my industry. And if you have an investment banker in your industry, consultants in your industry, uh, sometimes they know it. Uh, sometimes you as the owner of the company, uh, the seller of the company is, is going to know, say, hey, man, I, I know this. We bang heads all the time with this company uh, you know, up in Dallas. And man, if they, they could take me out and they could get Houston, they'd pay a premium for it. Um, you know, who has the most to lose, right? If, they, if somebody else comes in and acquires a company, uh, who's going to lose the most, right? This goes in, into the analysis. Um, you know, who are the competitors out there? And someone mentioned it uh, earlier that if you can take a competitor out of the marketplace, you take a big competitor out, uh, not only can you increase market share, but uh, quite often you can increase profitability. So it, in fact, it impacts the whole company, not just the acquisition that you have, right? So is there a company out there that can vertically integrate, right? Can you become a component in their, in their supply chain? Uh, so potentially a supplier, a customer that's out there. They can be a strategic acquirer. Uh, horizontal, somebody that's close. Uh, uh, the ex example that was given uh, by Brian on, you know, on hot dogs and hot dog buns. Maybe if you're a hot dog company, you know, can you, a horizontal integration would be acquiring a, a, a hot dog bun company, someone that's complementary. So when it was a printing company, we acquired some apparel companies because, you know, if, if you typically it was the same buyer that was buying printing, might buy hats, shirts, mugs, pens, stuff like that. Uh, geographic expansion is a big one. Who's a regional player that could really benefit by coming into Houston, coming into the Southwest, right? So how do, you, how do you do this? You, you really start the process early, early. Uh, Gary and I are both an EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, and there was an EO member several years ago. When he started his company, he says, I know who I'm going to sell this company to. And he reached out to the company that was a, a big uh, Fortune 500 company here in Houston, and he said, I want to build this company up, and then eventually it's going to be a good acquisition for you. He got to, he developed a relationship with the M&A people and operations uh, in the company, and he built his company up just to sell to that target. Um, so you start the process early. You know, how do you do this? You, know, you engage hunters. You know, who can go out there and hunt and find them for you? Investment bankers, uh, consultants. Uh, there's some incredible research, uh, research databases uh, that are out there. Uh, they cost uh, it cost thirty forty thousand dollars a year, and they keep track of all these acquisitions. Who's buying whom? How much did they pay for it? Right? Uh, there's industry research, industry data, uh, PitchBook. PitchBook I think is fifty thousand dollars a year, close to that research database, and has it's it's as it it covers more acquisitions and more industries than I think anything that's out of, out there. So. These consultants and investment bankers uh, have this and they have experienced uh, real smart MBAs that come out like from, from Rice, Texas, A&M, other schools around here. And uh, their job is to really research and understand the markets. So uh, these hunters can go out there and find these, uh, these strategic acquirers that are out there. Um, so, I've got another question. Time, to, time for me to stop talking and um, throw this out there. And I'll save some uh, time for questions and answers at the end, but there's, if there's anything over this, just raise your hand and, and we can take them now. But, uh, you know, why would Facebook pay $19 billion for WhatsApp when they had no profits and considered a great success? Why did they do it? I'll throw that out there. Another $15 common bond gift certificate. And no harm for guessing. There's Khan again. Yeah, I think it was covered very early on. Uh, customers, the value of that customer list, especially if, uh, if Facebook knows or thinks that that customer base is significantly different than what we currently possess. And it just adds a huge range of customers. They, they can do a lot with those customers. Yep. So that's what I would bet on. Con, it's a good bet. You got one of them. You got a $15 gift certificate. But there, there are a couple other reasons as well. What were some of the other reasons? 
Marco. One of my thoughts is Facebook has a chat feature, but perhaps it's not uh, to the level they want it to be. And so WhatsApp has perfected that in terms of communicating um, and opening that avenue, especially internationally. So yeah. trying to improve a product they already own or have. So technology, part of it was the technology. It's another reason. What, what, what's probably the reason why it became, and those, those are all reasons why they did. And they all added, if you think about the pyramid that we talked about, they all added that additional value to get up to, to $19 million. There's one really big reason why they, why they did it uh, as well. Uh, those are all a part of it. Brian? Uh, <clears throat> diversification. Maybe Facebook, you know, plans on spending this kind of money on other uh, technologies that are slightly adjacent to itself. So if Facebook, you know, just like the Instagram acquisition, if Facebook sees the chat being the most popular, but people have a negative connotation of Facebook and they already acquired the next best, latest and greatest thing, um, you know, it's an easy revenue model to move over uh, from their current users to say WhatsApp, if WhatsApp becomes their next, uh, you know, prime product. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a really big re reason, right? I mean, people were moving over to WhatsApp and, and they didn't like Facebook, right? And they cut, you cut that off. Um, which I, I think that's, that's along the lines of probably why they consider it to be, uh, you know, a, a success, a big success. Any, any others out there? Okay. Well, let's take a look at it. So why would they pay $19 billion? So Con, exactly right. Uh, 450 million customers, right? The cost per customer is $42 per customer. Facebook's lifetime value per customer is about 135. So immediate accretion right there. All right. In addition, they got access to customers in remote areas. You know, Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg from day one had this vision in his head of Facebook being worldwide. And that's one of the reasons why he turned down a lot of offers real early on, crazy valuations. But uh, so WhatsApp gave him the opportunity to access these customers in, in remote areas. Uh, along the lines of what Brian said, extremely active customers over 70% use the product daily, every day. I think Facebook was, um, at this time, I think it was 2013, 2014, was probably in the 50, 60% daily usage. Wasn't quite as high as it is today. Uh, one of the really big things, they eliminated a, an incredibly fast growing competitor. Incredible. They were growing at a, an incredible rate of adding, adding customers. And there was a potential that someone like Google, uh, Google's actually trying to buy. Facebook doubled Google's offer, I believe is what it, what it was, close to that. And they wanted to keep the company out of the hands of any competitors that could really threaten Facebook and threaten their world dominance, right? Um, and they did. They did. So, you know, you can never tell what would have happened had they not done it, but it could have, it could have been different, right? Um, they could have uh, morphed into more of a Facebook type. Uh, and they did get some great technology as well. So if you look at that, this is an example of the strategic pyramid where they just added all these layers on to come up with a justification for what seems to be a pretty crazy valuation, but in hindsight, maybe it was a bargain because it was strategic, right? Make sense? Uh, let's talk about, um, uh, this, this, is a, this is a valuation per user back at the time. So Facebook was valued at about $126 um, dollars per user. WhatsApp was $42 per user. I guess theoretically, I don't think they could have acquired WhatsApp and then sold Facebook at their valuation per customer, but certainly somewhere above that. So they probably got, you know, pretty close to uh, it. And again, there's probably, you know, joint users and everything on there when you, when you back it down. But, but um, certainly if you look at this value per customer, and I'm not sure what Facebook's cost per customer acquisition was back then, but um, 
you know, so in hindsight, it looks like it could have been a pretty good bargain for them. Even though you say, why would someone acquire a company for $19 billion with no profits, right? That's strategic. Uh, let, let me talk about a local Houston company. Ch change the name slightly, just because it's a small, small, uh, small world, small community. But um, Casey and I worked on this project uh, about five years ago. It was a local Houston company. They had a financial value, maybe $25 million top end. They had a oil and gas product, uh, very small sales and marketing companies uh, in this area. They had one production, one facility, they had a patent product. It didn't make it revolutionary, but it just said I, we, had, we had a patent process. It's a little bit different. Uh, there, there was still competition out there, but they had a, uh, a patented product. The owners were, it was growing, and they were reinvesting a lot of capital back into the business. So they had very limited liquidity. So they came to, they were looking at evaluate, evaluating growth and potential uh, exit options. Um, the target acquirer, became a big $8 billion plus European publicly traded company. Uh, they had an international sales force. They had 150 global distribution centers. They were selling mostly a commodity item, mostly commodity item. Uh, they had very limited tech products and they were getting a lot of, uh, we did a lot of res research uh, Casey did a lot of research and we found out uh, the CEO was getting a lot of pressure to kind of move from a commodity uh, to some type of more technology. So it came from the board, the CEO had a vision to make acquisitions and, and how did we find that out? You know, we went and it's publicly traded. So we, we, we looked at their, uh, their previous quarterly uh, conference calls, investor conference calls, what was on the website, what was on their press releases. And it was pretty easy to say that, hey, this would be a really a great a, a great target so uh got together uh and this is what we uh we put together uh this is a summary of it but we looked at the EBITDA you know what was the earnings um and again probably just the earnings are probably only want to justify maybe a, a 25 million dollar valuation uh but you know this the the strategic benefit for them was that it was a sexy new tech product that they could offer to their global sales force, right? And the global sales force could now sell it through 150 distribution centers and move from commodity to tech. There were synergies around accounting, finance, marketing, and HR, certainly with a bigger company uh, coming in there. Uh, they got some good assets. They got an established workforce. They got a production facility here in Houston, right? Uh, experienced team of key management personnel. Uh, and the real be benefit came from the opportunity to cross sell each other's products, right? So now down here to their customers, uh, I think uh, Jim Wheaton mentioned, um, it gave the big company access to some well-known names uh, here in Houston that they had these incredible relationships with. I mean, they hunted with them, they fished with them. They went to ball games with them, and they had this relationship that this big international company couldn't get, right? It would take years to develop it, but with the acquisition, they got it immediately. They got those handshakes, they got those relationships. Uh, and with that, they could cross sell each other's products. So it wasn't just a one-way street, it was a two-way street. You know, there were some other miscellaneous um, uh, benefits from it healthcare efficiencies, financing synergy, some overhead re re reductions. Um, you know, and, and one big, big thing that they got was just this PR bump, a PR bump. And when we went through it, it was 100% it was confidential. We couldn't leak this out to anybody. All the information going back and forth went through secured uh, sources and everything, just could, it just couldn't get out. Uh, but, but we knew there'd probably be some type of PR bump because that was the strategic objectives of the board and the CEO to go out and acquire some of these you know, more tech-based companies. So here's the results. Uh, 
it resulted in a $50 million plus valuation to the seller. And in a lot of our discussions, we said there might be more benefit to them saying it was a bigger acquisition than a smaller one. It might not have ticked on the radar screen at all. The acquiring company stock went up 80 cents a share right when it was announced. And it resulted in over $150 million increase in market cap that came out of this. Um, so it was, again, uh, did they pay over market value? Yeah, absolutely. You know, probably way more than double what market value was. But at the end of the day, it turned out to be uh, a win-win all the way around for them because it was strategic, it was well, it was well thought out. So um, here's my concluding thoughts. I know we have some questions coming in, but um, again, strategic buyers will typically pay more because of these increased synergies and everything that we talked about. Um, it's really important to start identifying and developing relationships with strategic potential strategic buyers well ahead. And really it's to understand what they want, what's important to them, right? Uh, do they have a direct you know, sales force? Is it based on the internet? Uh, you know, what, what's important to them? Uh, and you can start to do this work ahead of time. It's really important again to understand who has the most to gain and the most to lose. Sometimes again, buying a competitor in a small marketplace makes a big, big difference. But you know, who, who has the most to gain, the most to lose? A lot of people always say, you know what? I don't want my competitor knowing that I'm selling. It's true, right? So obviously, it's it's proceed with caution. You know, and how do you do this? And how do you uh, work with with competitors? Um, there's certainly process strategies around this, and 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 how you do this. Um, and you can work with advisors and consultants um, who can help with this. And they can also help uh, capture and quantify what your strategic value uh, would be, right? And, and a lot of the processes that you know, I, went, I went through. And again, you, know, you start the hunt for potential uh, strategic acquires early, you know, and you know, got to get out there and, and, and hunt for them and find them. So I think, uh, We'll, uh, we'll stop there uh, and I'll open it up to questions. I know Andrew, we had a few questions come up. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll hear everyone for the participation as well. I think it makes it more interesting. Yeah, feel free, raise your hand if you wanna ask it or throw it in the Q and A. In the meantime, we had some come through. Um, and then I wanted to touch on one thing. Um, it, it's <clears throat> what we've seen a lot of too uh, which we didn't really discuss here. It's it's private equity backed strategic buyers. So um, especially with smaller businesses um, or medium sized businesses, what we've seen it's you have a strategic coming to the table, but they're backed by private equity, and there's just a, a size value or size premium that they'll be willing to pay because they're doing a roll up or a bolt on acquisition, and so. Um, they might try to find a lot of similar companies and they'd be willing to pay a higher multiple because I mean, you've heard the one plus one equals three. Um, it, it could be coming from a private equity company, which would be technically a financial buyer, but when it's really going to be bolted on or rolled into a, a strategic, you kind of have a, a hybrid of the two. Um, so anyways, rambling. Yeah, that's but, a good point. Um, so, something else on that point too, if you're a, uh looking to acquire a company, not every company can be sold to a strategic acquirer, right? They're not positioned right, they're not set up right, they're not big enough, uh, they don't offer enough strategic benefits. So there's still a lot of companies out there that uh, are gonna sell to a just a purely a financial buyer, an owner operator uh, that's out there. Yeah, yeah. Good um, so well, one of the, the questions that was submitted from uh, Safir, if I'm, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but it was, how do you go about finding a strategic buyer and getting in front of them? Um, and I'll, I'll just say real quick, that's, that's one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves on. Uh, we have a lot of proprietary research tools. We can look at, you know, who's making transactions and acquisitions in that space, you know, who's very active there because um, private transaction data is extremely hard to come by. It's also about, you know, our network, um, Al, what else? How, how do you think finding the right buyer other than just some research? 
Yeah, you know, so it's a lot about what I teach in my class and everything. And say so there's no textbook. It's it's sometimes it's who can think out of the box the most. And just like Brian said, you know, if I got a hot dog company out there, you know, what what others can benefit. Uh, and sometimes it's a pretty, you see, it's a pretty crazy, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, match that that you can find. Uh, uh, one is to look at you know private equity companies and see what kind of companies do they ba- are they backing. Right, and is there a way to vertically integrate, horizontally integrate, take out a competitor? It's research, it's work at the end of the day. It's getting out there and thinking, thinking outside the box, um, talking to others in the industry, right, that are out there. We worked, when I sold my uh, printing operation, we worked with an investment banker that we found that was specialized in our industry. And he was the one that said, hey, we know this company out of Chicago, and they got kind of West Coast, East Coast, Midwest. They don't have anything in the Southwest, and I think they're going to really have an interest. And they did. We really didn't. They were head and shoulders uh, 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 ahead of anyone else that ever came in there, just for the fact. I I might not have known that, right? But you've got to do your homework. You've got to do your your research, and you work work with others that, that know, and they do this, you know, a lot. Yeah, one a question that just came through, it might actually have been while I was uh, chiming in on this, but the, can you please provide an example where a private equity buyer can be a strategic, um, which is exactly what I was just yeah. saying. You have a strategic in the space, they have some port codes that fall into line with existing operations um, and, and they, you know, they want to bolt it on and grow it. So yeah. one, um, one of the best fits is actually that if there's a, a buyer in the industry and they're backed by a private equity group, then the private equity group is giving the company the capital to go out there and do these things that we talk about. Right. Um, And the good, some of the good news for that is when they come in there, they really want to, they have a vested interest to grow the business, to to, to really grow it and do it, do what they can. Uh, You know, Again, might have to proceed with caution a little bit. And what are they known? Are they, are they known to come in there and cut staff 50%? Um, you know, are they known to be in there and, and start to micromanage? So you've got to, so are they going to be, there's, there's good and bad. There's good private equity groups and maybe, I don't want to say bad, they just have different strategies, but their strategy may be to really re- reduce cost um, and cut expenses, right? Um, but you've got to know that. And then we had one from Ray, Ray Lindsay, and I, I don't think he's on anymore, but it's relevant, so I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, what is the estimated impact on TEV, which I'm guessing is total enterprise value, with an all-cash buyer, you know, allowing for a little bit of escrow? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and Andrew and I wrote a white paper on it. Uh, Pre-COVID was market was a little hot. It was crazy. Uh, we had a good tailwind, a lot of capital out there and everything. And, and it was really a, a seller's market. Uh, Post COVID, you know, there's just, it's, it's an additional risk. So when you talk about all the risks that go into your financial valuation, COVID is just now another risk. So if you're looking to buy a restaurant uh, in 2019, they had two and a half million dollars in revenue. What's it going to be this year, but what's it going to be next year? So if you can come in there, certainly cash in, in a market like this uh, is going to get a discount, right? I mean, someone's going to discount and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can get all, all cash and get out of it. I'll, I'll take a discount. What that number is, you know, we don't know. And certainly it's going to impact different industries, different ways. Uh, companies that are coming out of COVID and don't show the impacts of COVID said, hey, look, we've kind of weathered this risk, so it's not really a risk that's going to go into significantly decreased value, um, unless maybe something prolonged or return to it could. But um, certainly as we come out of this, that you know, cash will be king, and, and I think buy- sellers are, are had a wake-up call. Uh, entrepreneurs say next year is not always going to be as good as this year, even though it might have been for the last six years, and it's a wake-up call. So, uh, it, it, as you take a look at that, there's going to be uh, certainly an impact to it. Yeah, and then uh, Al, can can you actually let me share my screen real quick? Uh, John, John had a, a another question about um, 
just what the current market's looking like. And I wanted to reiterate your point about the white paper and I was going to show everyone where they can go download it. Um, and Axial's middle market review is going to actually be publishing this on Thursday, I believe. Um, but we have it on our website. Hey, Andrew, I think your co-host, you should be able to do it. Let's see. Oh, oh let me yeah. stop sharing. We no, we're good. So if you go to our website resources on the resources page, drop down here. Um, we, we, this, this whole paper is about creating favorable transaction structures right now and what it's going to look like. Um, and it really is interesting because, um, to, to John's question, you know, what is it looking like? I'll give you a very quick example. We had a client, um, just like I was mentioning earlier, a private equity backed but strategic buyer um, was, was interested. COVID came, they had to kind of back away. Um, immediately after we had a actual strategic buyer um, come back to the table at a higher valuation, um, the, the, the former uh, private equity backed company had an all cash offer, which is great, but the strategic then came in, um, which hopefully we're gonna have closed pretty soon with a higher offer, but we're gonna have you know, an earn out, a little bit of a seller's note. And so this, this paper kind of explains all the different intricacies into how we're, we're, what we're seeing and how you can make you know, really good transactions still happen. Um, you know, once we get through the headwinds of this. So anyway, so that covers John's question. A anyone else, any, you know, raise your hand, throw it in the Q and A. Let's see, we got Gerardo. There we go, let me unmute your mic. Go for it, Gerardo. I'm done. I'm looking to buy a business and it has nothing to do with what you're talking about, but it does. It's a, and I'm just looking at finding a, businesses that don't necessarily are going through brokers because I see that a lot of the valuations and a lot of the ads are basically just wrong. And I want to see what your feeling is of, uh, of how to tap into the, you know, family owned businesses between five and $10 million in revenues without having to go to the bro through brokers. Yeah, John, we um, certainly, I teach the class on enterprise acquisition and, and there's a formal process for that. And I'd be more than happy to send you uh, some of the PDF chapters from it. But, you know, it's really, really important if anyone's on the buy side out, out there is you just have to spread your cast your net as wide as possible. All right, and that means part, you know, talking to CPAs like Gary Cooper, who who has clients come up, financial planners uh, like Josh, uh, even bankers, and and then as you start to narrow it down, if you say, okay, I want to go out and acquire, you know, five to fifty million dollars is a really broad range, and as you start to eliminate, and I'm not going to do restaurants, or I'm not going to do service based, I want a niche manufacturing company, you start to generate lists. Right, and if you narrow it down to industries, and then you have to start to network within those industries, and uh, get the name out there and known. I, I would not uh, downplay, you know, intermediaries, though uh, they have to be on your radar screen. Um, and and, and it, what you can do, and what we always encourage our students to do, is just be at top of mind. So when a deal comes in, a lot of the deals don't even make it out to the market, right? We get a really good niche manufacturing company comes in, million and a half dollars in, uh, in, uh, in earnings, a 65, 70 year old owner looking to retire. That's a hot commodity. And a lot of the intermediaries are just gonna pick the phone up and start contacting those that they know can move quick, are well-financed, are serious buyers, aren't gonna waste time, and they'll, they'll move pretty quickly with them. So um, you need to have them as a part of your process, but certainly not the whole process. And, and, and outreach, you know, LinkedIn and LinkedIn scraping is really a big thing. Uh, and if you can, you can go through LinkedIn and you can target specific types of companies, you can target business owners that are, are went to Rice or went to A&M or went to Texas and reach out there with them um, directly, networking and everything. But it's, um, 
it's a, it's a process, right? And you've got to really be out there rubbing el elbows and, and working hard and networking to, to get out there. So set up a lot of funnels, a lot of different funnels that deal flow coming in. And someone was asking, what's a good source to find historic EBITDA multiples, 2019 to 2020, revenue five to 20 million. That's the tricky thing. Um, there are sites, PitchBook. Uh, Pepperdine. Yeah, Pepperdine. Uh, if Casey's available, he might even know more than I do. But some of the brokerage sites like BizBuySell might offer that. We talked about it a few weeks ago. And I, of course, I'm drawing a blank now. But the ultimate answer is that it, it's really hard to come by that. Um, you have to have access to private transaction data, um, which means it has to be submitted by, you know, the, the, the seller. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to really throw something on there and I really want to say this, this is my uh, pet peeve. This is my one bellwether, I guess you'd call it. It's an average is just an average. And, Businesses, every business is unique. Every business is different. Um, I'll pull this back up here. Uh, can you see this? Uh, every every business every if you if you do get averages, they're just averages, which means half are above and half are below. And businesses in the same industry can have a wide range of valuation based on. They have customer concentration. Is the owner involved? How long have they been in business for? Um, you know, what's their profit margins compared to others in the industry and everything? So uh, you, you can get some of that. It's average, but it's really important to understand the process of business valuation and what type of businesses deserve kind of an above average and one or below. And just and always to remember that average is just a middle point. It's nothing more, nothing else. Well, I know we're, we're, we're over by a minute, but let's answer this, this last one. Um, Brent was asking how Exit Advisors as the, the sell side representation advises our clients whether to sell to a strategic versus a financial buyer aside from the purchase price. Yeah, I could take that, Andrew. I know you can add to it too. You know, it, it's best fit. So it's really understanding what the seller's needs are. Some really care about the legacy of the business. And some don't. They say, look, I don't care. I want the most amount of money and, and, and that's it, right? Uh, some will say, I never sell to that jerk down the road who's been a competitor for, for 10 years and say, well, if we gave you 50% more, would you still think he's a jerk? Um, some might say yes and some, some might say no. But, you know, a, a lot of that is really just in upfront up front and sitting down and understanding it. Um, Maybe there's a connotation of a private equity group that wants to come in there and cut costs and cut staff and says, I'm not going to cut, cut, cut staff, cut costs, right? I want someone that knows this business is going to step in there. So um, we really sit down and try to get a clear understanding uh, of, the, of the seller. Gary, I'm not sure if you're Andrew, want to add anything in there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think some, some private equity groups also, in, in some cases, could have deeper pockets than a strategic, um, you know, they might have LPs or a fund where they can make more acquisitions than a strategic could, you know, the strategic has X amount of bandwidth and might only do one or two transactions a year. Some cases they might do 10, but, um, you know, I think with private equity, there's really no shortage in some cases of, of access to capital, at least right now. Um, yeah. And, and so they might be able to accelerate growth. That's not always the case. That's just an example of how it could, could be. Yep. Good. All right. Well, I guess, you know, we're, since we're a few minutes over, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, but Al, thanks. Thanks for your presentation today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have more questions or want to talk online or offline. Um, we'd love to answer them and, and, you know, talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Any, any closing remarks, Al? No, A plus for everybody. Good, good, good job. Good input. Um, like, like Andy said, just reach out at any time. Uh, you know, a lot of it, we just encourage education and understanding, you know, the process and learning and there's a lot of materials out there, a lot of, a lot of information. And, and let us know what you want to hear too, because, you know, we've got a plethora of, of topics yeah. and, 
knowledge between mainly Al and Gary and, and some of our other business partners. But I'll make a, a plug for Gary's. I, I can't wait to hear Gary's on the potential impacts of the new political regimes. Uh, either way, it's going to come back. I guess it's going to change. So I can't yeah, wait Gary, to hear that one, Gary. On, uh, was that the 27th? <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about the different uh, platforms for each candidate, uh, what their taxes will look like and how that could potentially affect the economy, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and other aspects of business. Yeah. And then right. Steve next week is going to talk, uh, Steve. may want to talk about that a little bit. So, uh, Andrew, do you have do you have the information uh, on what the topic is next Wednesday? Yeah, Al, actually, I think you've got it on the, the PowerPoint side. Maybe you can pull that back up one more time for everyone. Yeah. It'll be really interesting. It kind of ties into what Al did today, but dives into the COVID aspects of it. Yeah, impact of COVID on M and A. And that I, I would encourage you to go read our our white paper too that I showed you, because um, that would be a really good segue into this. Um, and there's some other sources that we reference in the paper. Um, I, I think that'd be a really good prerequisite, if you will. And Steve Keston is an amazing attorney, yeah. amazing M&A attorney. And, and uh, he was actually a part of the deal that I used as an example, but he was, uh, he was amazing, amazing attorney. Great speaker. Yeah, you know, spread the word about these topics and, uh, you know, tell your neighbor, tell your friends, tell your business associates. Uh, I believe there's some very rich information that can be conveyed here. Uh, you know, have your lunch and listen in. It's uh, it's an easy system. It's really easy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And next next week, someone can get a common bond lunch and listen in, right? So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Fun. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And I guess class dismissed. Class dismissed. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Uh,